you know that Keeley Companies is all about fostering the world-class culture through their incredible cultural pillars. Well, it was time to add a seventh cultural pillar, Keeley Green. Guided by the mission to raise the sustainability standards by which they design, build, operate, and live, Keeley Green is dedicated to using a holistic approach to leave a positive impact on our environment, create a future that is sustainable for generations to come. In the words of Rusty Keeley, we are just getting started. You can learn more about that just getting started mentality and all the work they do by visiting my friends at Keeley Companies online at Keeley companies.com welcome to the live inspired podcast with john o'leary john is the number one national best-selling author of the book on fire he's a world-class inspirational speaker and he's the host of the live inspired podcast john interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story here's your host John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. Three decades. It's a long time. Three decades with Parkinson's disease might feel like a lifetime, though. For my father, the disease has made movement for him almost impossible. And yet, with the help of another person guiding him from spot to spot, supporting him in the shower, assisting him as he gets dressed, guiding his wheelchair from room to room, from doctor's appointment to doctor's appointment, the absolute impossible becomes possible. It's just their life that they share together. And this happens in their life all day, every day. For my dad, who I love, the person doing all this work is my mom. Her name is Susan O'Leary, and I'm wild about her. She's remarkable. She's amazing. She's faithful. She's someone that I look up to and my siblings look up to. And she's not alone. Each day, more than 54 million Americans are responsible for serving as a caregiver for a loved one. Often, caregiving is a burden to bear and a problem to be solved. And yet, as an expert in gerontology, Dr. Sarah Teton Cantor is on mission to make caregiving and care receiving a time to savor and an opportunity for personal growth using the power of positive emotions. Well, today, Sarah is going to join us to share the simple activities, the conversation inspiring questions, and the self care practices designed to immense caregivers and their care partners in gratitude, in empathy, and forgiveness, in love, and in awe. Why these five specific emotions? Well, by exuding these positive emotions, it has been shown to improve our health, reduce our stress, and create meaning in our life in spite of the challenges that we face on the journey through our lives. My friends, whether you are a caregiver, a care receiver, or just a friend listening into the conversation, I am absolutely convinced that in today's episode, you will leave it ready to embrace the full gift of life at every single stage of yours. So grab your favorite Live Inspired journal and pen. Grab that little something to sip on while we're listening to the conversation and get ready to welcome my friend and now yours, Dr. Sarah Teton Cantor. Dr. Sarah Teton Cantor, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. It's our honor. And as you and I were talking a moment ago, just Friday last week, I had a, a travel mate named Patrick Michael, my second born son, and he and I were in your neck of the woods, Lincoln, Nebraska. So to our audience who may not be familiar with your name yet or where you're from, just give us a little bit of a, your own introduction of who you are. Well, thank you for that. My name is Sarah Teton Cantor, as you said, and I am a gerontologist. I live here in Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm born and raised, went to the university originally for marketing and had a long career in technology and did my second act in getting my master's and my um, doctorate in gerontology just in the past five years. So now I'm, I've written a book and I'm excited to talk about the concept of positive caregiving with you. Well, the need is profound as all of our audience is already aware, but we'll talk more about the stats around that and how it influences and affects our lives. I'm going to have you spend a little bit more time in Lincoln, though, before you talk about our lives and positive caregiving in our journeys. 
What was life like for you growing up in Lincoln? Lincoln is a college town. So there's about 150, 200,000 people when I was growing up. Now it's grown to 300,000 people. Um, but it's a very, even though it's a larger town, it's a very tight knit town. Um, it feels very warm and inviting. People are very friendly. So it really is almost an ideal um, place to grow up. That's for sure. So that's the broader community. What about your individual household? I lived with my mom and my dad and my brother, and uh, we had a, I grew up in a very loving, supportive family. All of my aunts and uncles and grandparents were within a few hours of here. I was surrounded by a lot of love. Even from your brother? Even from my brother, who is still to this day one of my <laughs> favorite humans on earth. What were you interested in? Because I think your professional journey is so wild to go in some regards from extreme one side of the ledger to a totally different one. So as a kid, what were you interested in? I did all the things that a lot of kids do. I played sports. I played soccer. I was a cheerleader. I was in student council. Um, and I did always have and this is that's an interesting question because I, I'm not sure I've ever said this out loud. But I always had a fascination with nature and time mm -hmm. and life. Just what does it mean to be here? So I always had a little bit of a philosophical slant to my worldview. So <laughs> I've never really said that out loud. So it's mm -hmm. nature and time and life. These are concepts that some of our mature listeners don't think a lot about as we race from meeting to meeting and respond to emails and plan vacations and get ready for school years and everything else. And yet you as a little one, you were already thinking about nature and time and life. And then you go on to university. What, what was your major back then? Originally, I graduated with a bachelor's in journalism, but my major was advertising and like I said, I had a, a wonderful career in marketing in the technology field. And I want to jump right into the kind of the deep end here. But now that I'm thinking about it, I think I was almost running away from that deeper part of life, thinking about the deeper aspects of life. And so I really got on that success train. How do I make a lot of money, do a lot of things, you, you know, the yeah. quintessential American dream. <laughs> so. Well, you, and you lived it well. I mean, you became chief marketing officer, I think chief customer officer. Are both those titles right? That's correct. Yeah. And so you're, you've climbed to about the top run. And then life begins to remind you of what you knew as a kid, the power of nature and time and life as you enter into a new phase as a, you expand life. You, you have your own son. That's absolutely correct. Having a kid, I mean, you know, it, it really makes you take a step back and reassess everything. And you feel love like you've never felt before and in a way that is almost overwhelming. Hmm. So, but you do, you, you really kind of question the miracle of things because it is just such a crazy miracle that any of us are even here on earth. <laughs> so I think that's one of the most under discussed conversation we have as a society, how shocking it is that we're in the game. You know, we, we argue about athletics and all these other things that have zero real relevance. And so rarely do we talk about the profound gift of life itself as we, you know, grab our coffee and try to wake up and attack the day. We forget about the magic and the majesty of the day. So as you're holding this new bundle of joy, how did that begin to change for you? Well, you do. I, I wanted to literally go in a completely different direction. I wanted to revisit some of those things that I had flashes of as I was younger to really understand what does it mean to live a successful life or live a meaningful life. Obviously having a child brings extraordinary meaning, but I just kept feeling like there was more. Mm -hmm. And so you just keep learning and trying to figure things out. And I haven't figured it out. I'm still trying. 
it's, so it's odd because as I was trying to unpack your story and what led you into gerontology, I assumed that it would be holding a grandmother's hand or a neighbor who you just fell in love with. And it's an interesting that it's a child that reminds you of the power of our elders. So let, let's step back a bit. We've thrown around a term a couple of times, gerontology. Let's make sure our audience understands what the heck in th that word even means. What is gerontology? Yeah, gerontology is the study of aging, but I think that people get stuck in the rut of aging as a biological process, but aging is much more than our biology. We age psychologically, socially, spiritually, emotionally. So the holistic view of the human, how do we age as we move through time? That's really what gerontology is. And then this young mom who's got a million things to do goes back to school and you start learning more about that. That's a pretty long bridge to cross. Talk about getting your master's and then eventually your doctorate. I would say I was born a positive person. So I had always viewed life as a gift. And so aging, no matter what, was this immense gift. Then we did have a dear friend of the family um, had Alzheimer's disease. And my grandmother at the same time had vascular dementia. And as some of those cognitive changes occurred, I started questioning, is life still a gift if you have no memories or if your memories are changing, if you're changing? So my master's degree was revisiting the soul amidst the rise of dementia and looking at what is the part of us that remains? Because even within my grandmother and then our family friend that was a loved one of ours, there was something within them that remained. And that, again, after my master's degree, I needed to keep going because I hadn't figured it out. And what it really was in my whole doctorate, my dissertation was on emotions in living with Alzheimer's disease. And what my 10 years has taught me is that our emotions remain, even if there's cognitive changes. People living with dementia can still have very rich, important, meaningful lives when we focus on their emotions and providing them with the things that fulfill them emotionally. So you did your entire thesis on this. And, and when I prepare for interviews, I always bullet out like 199 questions to ask, and we get around to about 11 of them. <laughs> Somewhere on my list of 199 is that. Tell me more about your thesis, because it's unlike what I've ever even thought about before, that although the memories may fade, the emotions remain and maybe even are multiplied a little bit. So yeah. how can you be aware of that and also help create positive emotions in that space? When I was doing the, my thesis, that was revisiting the soul. I mean, you know, when we talk about the soul, people... It's funny if you ask someone, how do you define the soul and what does it mean and where does it exist in the body? And most people will just look at you blankly. And they, it's something that they think is inside them, but they can't really answer because they've never really thought about it. But there is a spark inside. And But then my dissertation, I think, was really when I got to the, the nitty gritty of life. And that is I, I used first person communication. So people living with dementia, it was a longitudinal study. And we looked at how language changed over time, over the course of four years from diagnosis to four years. We looked at language changes and then we looked at their communication and their writings from a qualitative perspective. And what I think was unique was that every person there was definitely a rush of negative emotions and overwhelming negative emotions right around the time of diagnosis. And some people had been living with um, cognitive changes and were a little bit scared to go to the doctor and get diagnosed. So some of people had been living with cognitive changes before the diagnosis. But what I think is the most important point is that after a year or two, when people got used to living with dementia, got used to adapting to the changes that were happening, all the positive emotions and all of the things that inspire positive emotions in people that were in my study, those things returned. So going on a nature hike 
or going to the art museum or having family dinner, those things were so meaningful and so important and so powerful in living a meaningful life. And we don't talk about those things enough. People just have this very negative narrative around what it means to live with dementia. And the reality is, is that there's still a lot of life to live. So we could take this conversation either to focus on those living with dementia or those loving the ones living with dementia. And I, I think that's the path that might make a little bit more sense to travel down. There's a quote that I wrote down. I wrote down about 11 from your book, but here comes one of them. <laughs> For many of us, giving and receiving care is inevitable, not an if, but a when. And then you say positive caregiving offers an approach to caregiving that can help make it a time to savor and an opportunity for personal growth, about how many people ultimately will realize that they are now a caregiver? How, how common is this job title now? The numbers range anywhere from 40 to 60 million just in America alone of people caring for an older loved one. But there are quite a few people that wouldn't even call themselves caregivers, but they are. They're providing support and love and care for their loved ones, even on a part-time basis or a remote basis. You and I were talking before we hit record that not always is it a positive view that folks take toward caregiving or toward the concept of others taking care of others. So let's begin with that. Why, why do you think it's so rampant that many times we don't view this as a gift? There's a heavy stigma around aging. That's number one in America. There is a stigma. And you know, what we hear a lot is stories about caregiver burden and caregiver burnout. So part of that is just the narrative that we have in America. And then there's also uh, the myths or um, the things that people just don't know about living with dementia. And so all those things get kind of muddy, muddy the perception of what caregiving can be for an older loved one. How do we begin to make that pivot from viewing it as a burden to embracing it as a gift? Well, I think that that's the mission that I am on for sure. Um, it's why I wrote the book that people just have, I, I think the very first step is just approaching the situation with a better attitude, with seeing it as an opportunity rather than an obligation. It's an opportunity in our own personal growth as adults to care for those that we love and what do we want as, as we get older? What kind of care would we want to have? I think that's an important thing that we should be thinking about in our young adulthood and middle adulthood as well. It's um, everyone eventually is going to need assistance, whether that's for a short period of time through an acute illness or injury, or if it's for a longer period of time through age-related related changes, people need care. And so how do we do that in a way that deepens our relationships with the people we're caring for, as well as building our own personal resilience. And so that's the idea behind the whole concept of positive caregiving. Sarah, I've heard you share before that although the burden is real, yeah, the, ch the challenges of loving someone who might be struggling physically or emotionally or in their memories, uh, you can't hide from the fact that there are challenges that come with that. You've also shared, though, that many caregivers actually end up living longer. They end up living healthier. They end up living more vibrant, more meaningful lives. Why do you think that is? Well, I think passion and purpose and love. I mean, as humans, don't we all want that? Right? We all like to live a life full of purpose and love. And some of the positive emotions that I talk about in the book, gratitude, empathy, forgiveness, love, and awe, those are emotions, but they're also skills that we can build as humans. And so caring for one another is a perfect opportunity to build those skills and to strengthen those skills for a lifetime. Let's jump into those emotions <laughs> and skills. You laid them out, so I'll repeat them one by one. Gratitude. Obviously, when you do a Live Inspired podcast and you are, uh, what, 600 episodes in, we've talked a lot about gratitude on this podcast. What's the importance of gratitude, not only for a caregiver or someone receiving that care, but for a normal human being going forward in life? Well, 
I mean, there's been all kinds of research about the positive things that it can do to our bodies and our brains. But I think that, you know, we talked about when you're caring for someone you love, it's typically because they are, you know, facing an acute illness, like I said, or an injury, or they're working through age-related changes. And that can be scary and sad and stressful and frustrating, all of those things. And what gratitude can do is be a great balance mm -hmm. to some of those negative emotions. And as a skill, it can help pull you out, bring you back to the present and bring you back to the things that uh, bring us joy in life. So they're a balancing tool more than anything beyond the, the mental and physical benefits that gratitude can do for us. So you, you and I were talking before we hit record and you know that I'm a speaker and that means I have an opportunity of holding a microphone and being in front of audiences. It also gives me the opportunity of one by one meeting those individuals afterwards. And that's when they come up and they share their stories, whether it's a, a burn event or an early diagnosis of cancer, or a million struggles that we go through in life. Many, many, many people these days are talking about being part of the sandwich generation. They're, they're doing their very best and it's exhausting to raise their kids. That alone is enough. It's tiring. And then they're employed. And so they're trying to bring in a little bit of money and have a little bit of balance. And then in addition to all of this, they're taking care of their parents or an older neighbor or another family member. And so they're feeling like there's absolutely nothing they can do for themselves. For, th for those of us who feel that way, we're just oh, all these things coming down on us. What are some practices that allow us to not just hear the idea of gratitude, but model it? There's quite a few in the book, but I think that this is what is so wonderful is that these are things that are free to all of us as humans. Breathing's one of them. Breathing in gratitude, exhaling fear or frustration or stress. It was just simple act of breathing is one. I went on a walk this morning with my pup before this call, and I always try to take a gratitude walk. What are the things in this very day? that I am grateful for. So it was a cooler morning this morning than it has been in a long time. I saw a monarch butterfly on the ground and it let me take pictures of it. I couldn't believe it. It was like, it was, it, it was actually posing for me. I mean, there's all these things, even the act of walking, heel the to toe to, to say, thank you. Thank you. I mean, there are all these things that are so simple to bring us back to that gratitude that we don't have to necessarily change our routine. We can incorporate it into our daily routine. You also bring up the idea of not only you taking that gratitude walk, heal, heal the toe, heal the toe, monarch butterfly, but sometimes doing that with another. And then if you're unable to take that walk with another human being, because maybe they're in a bed, uh, of the idea of sharing gratitude together over mm -hmm. what it was like growing up, favorite chores that you did, at least favorite chore that you might've had, all these different things that can build a bridge, build connection, and ultimately lead to gratitude between caregiver and the person receiving that love. Yes, I mean, life review and reminiscence, we know um, how important that is in life. You know, as a gerontologist, I mean, we spend a, quite a bit of time in our programs talking about the importance of that the power of reminiscence and sharing with one another our stories. It not only is a way to build bonds and share wisdom, but it helps us as individuals make sense of life and helps us put things into perspective. So I, yeah, that is just absolutely every moment that we have with our loved one, whether it's a walk or sitting and visiting or just holding hands, that sharing is, is really important. And one of the most beautiful things about caring for one another as well. You, you dropped out five emotions and skills a moment ago. And the first was gratitude. The second was empathy. Empathy is a great one. I, I uh, have the honor of being raised by two elite parents who I dream of being coming more like one day, like they're just role models to anybody who knows Susan and Denny. And on a certain weekend, my mother went out of town with her daughters, which meant I got to spend the weekend with my dad. And there was a moment when I was transferring him from a wheelchair to the toilet and we missed a step. We both slipped on the bathroom floor. We both fell down and we were both okay. 
But on the bathroom floor with my dad staring at me and, and me staring back at him, it was this unbelievable like cataracts removing surgery of having compassion, empathy for where he was, for what my mother dealt with, for the life they were currently living and the struggles they currently faced. So em empathy is just a beautiful way to, <laughs> to see another person as they are. Uh, tell me what you think empathy means and then how do we magnify that gift? Yeah, so empathy, we know that it's innate in all of us as humans, right? We've observed even babies showing the ability to have empathy for others. But it is something that is nurtured and strengthened throughout our lifetime. Um, it's not just putting ourselves into each other's shoes. It's really recognizing that every single individual has a unique worldview that is built based on their own personal experiences and relationships. And so understanding that is important for growing our relationships, but it's also important if we want to get a path to forgiveness and to deeper love. So it's, it's almost like a stepping stone in this process to the love and awe that I think really makes life extraordinary. So before we move into forgiveness and then love and then awe, what is a, a, a thing we can do to spark or ignite, uh, elevate our own ability to be empathetic? Listening is probably one of the most important things that we can do is to really listen to each other's stories and to listen to each other's uh, communication. You know, sometimes we might have to dig a little bit deeper. There might be reasons behind an anger or a frustration, you know, so it's really taking a step back and and really trying to go deeper what what's behind a person's actions or emotions or communication and then you mentioned forgiveness a moment ago i you know, holding your child you realized you wanted to unpack life and the depth and beauty and the struggles of life and one of the struggles we all deal with is this challenge in forgiving ourselves for some of the things we've done, words we've spoken, missteps we've taken, and others for some of the things they've done against us or not done for us. So talk me through what it means. Why is there so much value in forgiveness? And then how do we begin stepping toward that gift? Yeah. Again, all five of these emotions have mental and physical benefits. There's a, a doctor Barbara Fredrickson, and she talks about how emotions can broaden and build. And, and it's almost like forgiveness allows us to get to the best parts of life. Again, the, the love and the awe. When we are caught in rumination about something we've done and we aren't able to self-forgive, or if we are caught in anger or not able to forgive someone else, it's really hard to get to the good stuff. It's really hard to feel those feelings of love and awe, which again, I believe are two of the most significant things that we get to experience as humans on earth. Forgiveness paves the way for more of that. And so it's as a skill, it's something that has been really important in my own life, especially self-forgiveness for things, like you said, that we mm -hmm. said or that we did, that we wish we wouldn't have. Self-forgiveness is so important to moving forward. We can agree that it's important. Walk me through a strategy and how we can either forgive ourselves for something we did or forgive others for something they may have done to us, a, a hurt that we're carrying forward into this day. Yep. So. <laughs> and not to go back to the walking thing, but I, I love to walk. I love to walk outside and walking a labyrinth. There's a couple labyrinths here in Lincoln, Nebraska. There's labyrinths located across the globe, but that's the circular path that you walk into the center and then you can walk back out. That process can be 
from a lens of forgiveness, that process can be an act of forgiveness if you walk with intention. I'm going to let this go. And when I get to the center, I'm going to let it go. That's one thing. Also, some simple things that we can do. And, and again, these take practice. But if it's, you know, you said something wrong or you said something you wish you wouldn't had, saying I'm sorry, you know, that just the simple act of saying I'm sorry. And the more you say it with a heartfelt, true meaning behind it, the easier it is to do that. Those are two very simple things that we can do. And you don't have to have a labyrinth to, to do in the circular path to, to forgiveness. You can walk around the block and just say, okay, I'm starting here. I'm going to think about it. And by the time I get back to where I, I started from, I'm going to let this go. And if we let it go, and if we allow someone else to pick it up and they, they can do with what they want with it, it seems like it opens us up to your fourth step, which is love. I have a, a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. hanging on my wall over to your right, my left. And there's so many lines, quotes, speeches that I love from this man. But one of my most succinct lines that is just him in a nutshell. He says, it's hard for me to like the man who is kicking me in the head when I'm on the ground. And then I realized I don't have to like him. I just have to love him. Okay. And uh, for a man fighting for equality in the 60s, that's a powerful line as he was mm -hmm. literally getting kicked in the head. We may not be getting kicked in the head, but there are days where we feel like it, whether it's from a child that we're holding or a spouse that we've been loving and taking care of for a long time or the struggles of the world are just coming at us. Talk about the power of love and uh, why it matters so much in making sure that we, uh, we're healthy going forward. Yeah, again, the love um, can heal us in so many different ways, right? Uh, mentally and physically. I learned the nameless love that exists too. The little acts of kindness to people that we don't know or the smile to someone that um, we meet on the street. These are just minor, minute acts of love that we can give to each other. And those can build on each other and they continue to pass from person to person when we think about it. Um, I know that when someone's kind to me, a stranger's kind to me, I immediately feel better and I try to be kind to the next person. I mean, these are things that right. we've right. since we were little, but um, that love, it's even bigger than the familial love that we have with our kids and our parents and our siblings and our friends. Love is even greater. And to the Martin Luther King Jr. point, he was the epitome of love, love as true act of forgiveness and understanding that what a miracle it is to all be standing here on this earth at the exact same time, at the exact same moment, and how extraordinarily rare that experience is. And so love is the great web between all of us. Well, and then it seems the summation of this leads to the fifth characteristic, which I uh, respect enough. I wrote a whole book about it. I wrote a book a couple of years ago called In Awe. And it's about living life with the wonder of a child and what that might do for us as we age. So I think you and I have a little bit of overlap on this one. I love it. So awe, what, what, in your mind, what is awe? And then what's the value of it? And then how do we practice more of it? I love the word awe because it, it feels like a lot of people understand what it means to be in awe of something, but there's other words for it. There's like transcendence or for me, when I experience awe, time for moments stops and I feel connected to something bigger. I don't know what it is, but I feel connected to something bigger. And then that positive emotion of all those positive feelings last beyond that moment. And a lot of times people, when they think about awe, they think about grand, maybe standing in front of Grand Canyon or standing you know, at the bottom of a mountain and looking up and just at the grand things in this world. But I think people can experience awe in just the small things in life as well. Again, the monarch butterfly that actually posed for me this morning 
those things can induce awe as well. So training our brain and developing that skill is an important thing for all of us to do. Well, and as we walk through those, we walk through them almost like an individual self-help exercise, which is one way to do it. And, and yet clearly your work is about making sure we do it collectively. And in particular, whether you're raising a child or you're serving as a caregiver, care partner, that maybe it's the kind of thing you could do with someone else that you care for and that you love. So from your years of research around this and your anecdotal feedback that you're receiving, can you share a story of a family, a caregiver and someone they were caring for that took one of these ideas and put it into practice and, and just kind of tell their story? Sure. One of the activities is creating memory boxes and people can do that whether they're living together, taking mementos and putting those things together, or they can do that if their loved one is living in a care community. That's one thing that they can do. I'll just give you an example that I do with my family. Every Sunday, my parents and my mother-in-law, we have dinner and we travel the world together through our foods and through music and through um, a history video. So my youngest, my 12-year-old chooses a country and we do the research and we dine together and we eat the foods from the country that we're visiting and we watch a history video. We're all learning together. We're growing together. We're sharing. We're talking about our own um, experiences in those countries, if we've ever been, which, you know, for my parents, they haven't traveled outside of the United States. So this has been a wonderful thing that they're continuing to grow and experience the world around them without actually having to leave. But it's a great bonding and sharing opportunity that is grounded in love and gratitude. And, and a lot of times we do experience awe when we're seeing some of the places that are in these um, countries or learning about some of the history that has taken place with leaders and people that have come before us. So um, that's another example. I love that example. What, a, what an awesome way to wrap up a weekend. So from uh, those dinner table conversations in Lincoln, Nebraska, wh where's the coolest country you visited as a family? Oh, we've been to so many. I think one of my favorite ones was Iran. One of my son's friends from school, his parents are from Iran. And so I asked her, his mother, if she would come and help me cook. And so it was a wonderful experience. We made tuku sabzi is what it is. And it's just these fresh herbs with an egg. It's almost like a thick herb omelet. Absolutely fantastic. But just learning about different cultures and the foods, again, um, we had a wonderful time and made a deeper relationship with the friend as well. Cool. Great activity. So I, I'm going to ask you a couple of practical questions now, and then we'll get into a, what we call the Live Inspired Seven. Many of our listeners have a family member, sibling, parent, maybe even a child who needs constant support and guidance and caregiving. And they may not be able to provide it all by themselves. If you're hiring a caregiver, what are some tendencies or questions that you should ask them or a way to make sure that you hire the best person you possibly can to care for your loved one? Yeah, I think that this is where really getting to the personnel, like the communication styles and the values of a caregiver, do they match up with your loved one? Because I think that that's really important that we're trying to provide support to our loved ones with people who can communicate well with them and are living the same values as our loved ones. Because when we are living aligned to our values is when we are our, our, our best. So asking about people's um, values and, and communication style and listening style, you want the relationship to be one grounded in trust and um, mutual respect. So just making sure that that's top of mind and front and center, um, I think is important. Financially, the, the, the burden financially, it, unless you are extraordinarily wealthy, is exhaustive. 
it just becomes the kind of thing that will eventually uh, bleed you dry as any family. What are some things that we need to be aware of? Maybe you haven't even thought about as families on how we can make sure we handle this appropriately and as effectively as we possibly can. Yeah, I think that's a great question. A couple of things. Number one is that lean on your family and friends because it does take a village to care for each other at all ages of life. And most people want to help if they're asked. That's an important thing. Number two is there's a lot of resources available in our communities to support people from respite care. So giving the care, the primary caregiver a break, there's a lot of free resources or organizations through churches and our area agencies on aging in our different communities that provide some support, respite care. Again, adult day centers where people can go and get some time with peers and others while the caregiver gets a break. Those are all things that we just need to be aware exist in our communities. And a lot of times we just don't know that they exist. Right. I mentioned earlier that many of our audience members come up afterwards and they share the struggle and the joy of raising kids and guiding their parents forward as well. At the same time, the sandwich generation. The other struggle we hear frequently though, the other challenge that people bring forward afterwards is this idea of, I wish I could do that, but I live in San Francisco and they are in Seattle. I'm in Florida and they are in Wisconsin. So for those who wish they could be there for their family or dear friend, and they can't be, how do you effectively care for someone from afar? First thing is that many people do. So I think that's important for people to realize is that we can be care partners to people who are living far away from us. It's getting to know the neighbors of your loved one, getting to know the support systems within their own community that they're living in, making sure that there's a routine schedule of touching base with them, making sure that you understand what are all the challenges and wishes of your loved one, having those front and center and having those conversations, especially with our technology nowadays, where we can get on Zoom or we can call our loved one on the cell phone <laughs> at any time. We can attend doctor's appointments or appointments with our loved ones via Zoom or with a phone. So we don't have to be mm. right next to our loved ones to be a good advocate, care partner, and even to build the relationship. Even the book, Positive Caregiving, there's hundreds of questions you could ask each other over the phone. You don't have to be sitting next to each other to really build that relationship. You dedicated the book to Spencer. <laughs> Who is he? And one day when he reads it, what do you hope he gets out of it? Oh, I love that question. Thank you. Well, Spencer is my 12-year-old. He is my only child, the, the child that actually pushed me in this direction towards aging and gerontology. Thank you for noticing that. Yes. So Spencer is my son. He is my never ending source of love and awe. But I hope that he reads this and always remembers to return to the simplest things that bring us joy in life. That And that relationships are what matter most and that gratitude, empathy, forgiveness, love and awe are what matter most. Uh, they do not know us, and that's why we keep going back to the same type of talking points week after week after week on the Live Inspired podcast. It's also why we wrap up every one of these conversations with seven questions. So, Miss Sarah, buckle up, get ready for it, because here they come. They're uh, they're in your court now. Question number one is: What's been the most inspirational book you've ever read? I think "Being Mortal" by Atul Gawande. Tell me about it. He's a physician who had to face his father's own impending death. And what does that mean when you're living it versus when you are living your life as a physician, caring for everyone else? And then when it becomes your own experience, how that changes the lens through which we see the world. What's one positive characteristic or one trait that you possess as a little girl growing up? that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? Probably fearlessness. 
if your home caught fire and Spencer's out and Troy's out and the dogs are out and every living thing is out and you have an opportunity of running in and grabbing one item, what's the one thing you would come racing back outside with? Probably my grandmother's um, wedding band. Why? I had a very special relationship with her and there were multiple grandchildren and, and I got that band and it's been something that I've worn at every major milestone of my life since she's passed away. So my graduation from college, my graduation with my doctorate, my marriage, all, all the things that have mattered, I always put it on so she's with me symbolically. If you could sit on a bench on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation with anyone living or deceased, who would you like to be seated next to? Probably Martin Luther King Jr. What would you ask him or what, what would you want him to know? I would ask him how he kept love growing, even in the face of so much anger and hate. It just was always there and it just kept growing. And I wish I had that strength. When you want to get fired up, Sarah, later on into our audience, listening to me, uh, watch his final speech ever given in Memphis, Tennessee, when he acknowledges he has been to the promised land. He may not get there with you, but he has seen what's over the horizon. It is the most prophetic, powerful conversation ever given. And they were some of the last words he spoke. So I, I think he was convicted by where things were and where he knew things had to go and how he knew we were going to get there. So <laughs> powerful man. What's the best advice that you've ever received? Don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> I always go back to that one. That book might be on my wife's nightstand. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's one we're familiar with, too. <laughs> what would you tell your 20-year-old self? This bl blossoming marketing professional getting ready to take on the world, what advice would you give yourself at age 20? Well, I, that one I do know because I've been trying to tell it when I teach kids in their 20s now, I always say, what are all of the things you want to do with your life? Not what are you going to do with your life? What are all of the things? Never stop growing. Never stop learning. Keep growing. Dr. Sarah Teeden, cancer. It has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like yours to read? Live in awe. Sarah, thank you for living in awe. Thank you for holding a child and recognizing that as valuable as that aspect of life is, so is the final breath we take this side of eternity. It's, it's been a great joy learning about your story, reading your book, and then learning from you today. Oh, it's been just a pleasure. Thank you so much. My friends, that is Dr. Sarah Cheating Cantor. My name is John O'Leary. Today is your day. Live in awe and live inspired. Well, my favorite part of today's conversation is the weekly activity that Sarah does with her husband, their 12-year-old son, th their parents, and her mother-in-law. It turns out that every Sunday, her son chooses a country to, you ready for it? Visit. But you can leave your passport behind as she tunes in from Lincoln, Nebraska. They'll do a bit of research on the destination and its history, then prepare and eat a meal together that's related to that country together. It's a great bonding experience. It's a great sharing opportunity that is grounded in love and gratitude and learning and celebrating the gift that is life. And it's one that I'd love to recreate with my own family. So mom and dad and friends, Beth, kids, get ready for it because it's coming to our house at a Sunday near you very soon. And as you're getting ready for your version of that Sunday dinner, if you enjoyed today's conversation as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you, I have a feeling that you would love the conversation I had about a year ago with Richard Louie. As we recognize World Alzheimer's Day today, hear Richard share how he left his 30-year career to take care of his father with Alzheimer and how the prolonged illness taught him the power of selflessness. While caring for others has profound difficulties so often, Richard reminds us how it can also offer an abundance of purpose and joy. 
If you want to hear that conversation with my buddy Richard, check it out at www.johnolearyinspires.com forward slash podcast. That's where you'll learn more about the conversation with Richard. And for my friends who are trying to do community together, whether that means virtually or live and in person, I've got an awesome opportunity for you. The Saturday after Thanksgiving, what are you doing? Why not join me? We're going to get together live with a bunch of friends. I'll be bringing in some colleagues that I've met in airports, on stages, through the podcast over the past several years, on one stage to inspire you to recognize the great grand gift that is your life. We've not done a live produced event through Live Inspired since before COVID. It's been a hot minute, and this is going to be an awesome party. You won't want to miss it. For the friends who can join us live and in person in St. Louis, awesome. There's room for you there. And for my friends who want to tune in from live streaming anywhere in the United States or anywhere around the world, we'll have four cameras shooting, producing it live to bring it right into your home, to your family. You can learn more about this event at onfireforgood.com. Let me say it to you one more time because these tickets are selling out. I promise you it's going to sell out soon and you'll want to be there. So join us at onfireforgood.com, and I'm looking forward to seeing you on November 25th. So for this time, and until next time, my name is John O'Leary, and today is your day. What a gift. Live inspired. Keelians were encouraged to have a conversation with someone outside of their circle. That's it. These conversations, however, have brought people together and farthered their world-class culture. Shout out to the Keelians who have made an effort to have meaningful conversations with new friends. You can learn more about those conversations, about those amazing friends, by visiting them online at keelycompanies.com.